Okay, welcome to Vicki. Tonight we're discussing women's issues and we have with us Tracy and Sally and Beth and V and Robin. And I guess I want to start. I'm Sandy Baird and I put together this program that Vicki will be doing this semester, including tonight we'll be talking about the status of women, particularly around health issues, reproductive issues, and maybe the ERA if we get to it, and other issues that will impact women all across, really across the world, not just in the United States. Um, I want to begin by saying that I believe that certain people, all people maybe, are a little uncomfortable dealing with women's issues and women's health in particular, because so much has to do with reproduction, with the issues of abortion and birth control, and I think it makes some people very uh, uneasy, so we're going to have to, we want tonight to have a very frank discussion about those issues, because it's definitely going to affect the presidential race coming up in 2020. Okay, so I guess I will start. Should I start by explaining where Roe v. Wade comes from in the first place? Legally? Mm -hmm. Sure. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, the numbers of women in this group, Sally, I don't know about the other women, were involved in the initial legal cases which, uh, which allowed abortion to become legal in the United States. And Beth. And Beth, right. I didn't know Beth at, at the time, Beth, so I'm sorry, but uh, we were near. What? You were not in Vermont at that time. This was in about 1972. Um, but I'm going to talk more about, and that was the time when there was a legal case in Vermont, in the Supreme Court, which allowed abortion to be legalized or decriminalized, really. And what I mean by that was there was only one law on the books about that subject of determination of pregnancies, and that law was against doctors. And it said that doctors could not terminate a pregnancy. However, a woman could herself. So the court in that case, it was called the Jack Lennar case, decided that because it was not a crime for women to do that, then it's not a crime for a doctor either to do it. And so in a sense, in 1972, abortion became legal in Vermont. And in that interim process, uh, in, 19, in the spring, I think, a bunch of Vermonters got together and formed the Vermont Women's Health Center in Colchester. It was the first clinic, women's clinic, in, I think, in the, in the country, probably, right? Although it had been, abortion had been legalized in New York State prior to that in Vermont, that was the first, we founded the first women's health center, which provided full services for women's health which meant birth control, abortion, gynecological examinations, and acted as a full women's health center. And that still is in existence, although I believe it's now become a partnership, right, with Planned Parenthood. It's actually, I don't think, in existence anymore. It's, it, it became part of Planned Parenthood, as far as I know. <laughs> um, anyway, so that was in Vermont. But in 1973, there was a US Supreme Court case that was decided that was crucial for this issue, and that was the case of Roe v. Wade. And I wanted to mention where that legally came from. There are many people who argue that it has no real legal basis in the Constitution. However, it does. It has a legal basis in the Constitution. And when you, uh, when you hear the arguments that were used, very young attorney Sarah Weddington was here. Oh, yeah. I'm sorry. Sarah Weddington was her name, and she was a very young attorney. As she says, she had done a few adoptions and uncontested divorces. When she was asked to argue uh, the case to the Supreme Court, and that was in 1972. How was it decided then? And it's being attacked today. In fact, that's one of the big uh, promises that President Trump has made, is to overturn Roe v. Wade, Wade and to even criminalize women if they have had, or if they do an abortion. Did you all know that? That he has suggested that women be punished uh, if for an abortion. I would remind our viewers, if there are any out there, that many women, whether they talk about it or not, does anybody know the statistics on that? The Good Mother Institute, I, I, I'm, this isn't up to date, but 45% of women in this country will have had an abortion sometime. Right. And 
Emily's list today said that 80% of women or voters, I've forgotten now, favor abortion. Yeah, well, I've never seen that statistic change. From the earliest days, at least 60% of Americans favor legal abortion, keeping abortion legal. Okay, so I'm going to read you the amendment, and then maybe we'll discuss how, why this favors women's rights to choose. So the 14th Amendment, and some of you got, have gotten the Constitution with you. It's on page 25 of this little Constitution, which I'm like Senator Byrd, a senator from the South who always carries the Constitution on me most of the time, unless I forget it. So page 25, excuse me, and this is the 14th Amendment of the U.S. Constitution. And let me tell you when it was passed. It was passed in 1868 in the uh, post-Civil War era, right after the Civil War. So I want to maybe the people here to look at that 14th Amendment, and you can tell me two things. What does this have to do with the Civil War, and what does it have to do with uh, women's rights to choose? OK, here's what it says, the opening lines. All persons born or naturalized in the United States and subject to the jurisdiction thereof are citizens of the United States and of the state wherein they reside. And no state shall make or enforce any law which shall abridge the privileges or immunities of citizens of the United States. And then it goes on to say that all citizens have the right to the equal protection of the law, equally. So what does that have to do? I'll tell you why this amendment was passed, and it really has nothing to do with um, termination of pregnancies, right? Nothing. It did have to do with three very important amendments that were passed immediately following the Civil War. One, the 15th, which gave black, people, black men the right to vote. That's the one that's the subject to um, the movie Lincoln, which is a movie that everybody should see. It's a fabulous movie. Okay, so this was passed at the end of the Civil War when four and a half million black people were emancipated. No skills, no jobs, no homes, no families, but they were free from slavery. Okay, so this said, after much, much fights, that black men, because the whole legal status had to be re redesigned for black for former slaves. The whole Constitution had to be reconstructed in a way to what were these people that were, had never been free before. Black men under the 15th were granted the right to vote. The 14th made them what? According to this, what did the 14th Amendment do to those former slaves? You can't figure it out? Made them citizens. Made them citizens. All persons born in the United States in 1868 became citizens of the United States, okay? And then in the uh, 15th Amendment, oh no, I'm sorry, the 13th Amendment abolished slavery. The 14th we're gonna discuss in a minute. The 15th gave black men the right to vote. Okay, so what about the 14th? The 14th made everybody here that was born here a citizen. It's important, right? And entitled to all the privileges and immunities of all other citizens. By the way, does this make Native American citizens? I should have. <laughs> no. Read subject to the jurisdiction of the United States. Indians, Native Americans were never, never wanted to be subject to the jurisdiction of the, uh, the United States. At that time, um, Native Americans were in their separate nations and they were considered to be in separate nations and dealt with by treaties. They didn't want to be citizens. They became citizens against their will in like much later in the 19th century, okay? Anyway, okay, but what does then the 14th Amendment really do about Roe v. Wade? And this was the argument that Sarah Weddington used. She based her legal arguments on the 14th Amendment. Tracy, you should know this. Oh, Tracy was studying the law. Only applies to persons born or naturalized. Right. It applies to persons who are born. Read it. Yeah. Born people have citizenship rights. That was the argument which favored. Wow. Okay. Did you know that? No. 
Okay, it's important. So when someone ever gives you grief about the rights of fetuses, do they have any rights under the 14th Amendment? No. Any legal rights? No. It's born people have rights. Because born people are citizens of the United States. So that's really the basis of it. So how do the other, the people who are against a woman's rights to choose argue about this? In fact, who is the born person in the controversy? The, the, woman. the woman, the mother. She is the citizen of the United States, and therefore she has the right to the equal protection of the law under the U.S. Constitution and under the state constitutions as well. Isn't there an emphasis on the right to privacy? Is no, it, is it privacy? No, no it, that's how it was interpreted. Way? No, it was interpreted that way by the U.S. court. So when, when Roe v. Wade was decided, there were three stages of protections. In the first three months, remember, the fe nothing, no, no state interest. A woman could go to a doctor and immediately get an abortion, immediately without questions. Second stage was a little bit different. In the second stage of pregnancy, the second stage, the court said, well, the state can regulate it at that point. They can say, for instance, that a woman has to go to a hospital or that a doctor has to perform it, although that has not been upheld either, the doctor part. Okay, that's the second stage between first three months without question, second three months, state can regulate. Third, tri to third trimester, the state could prohibit abortion in the third and last stage of the pregnancy. However, there's even an exemption for that, which the exemption is unless the woman's health is going to be damaged. The focus, in other words, on Roe v. Wade was not on fetuses, it was on a woman's rights as a citizen of this beleaguered republic. So, so Roe v. Wade defined those three states? Right. Okay. Correct. That was the first time. the trimester concept was mm -hmm. that. And you know who else had that concept until the end of the 19th century was the Catholic Church. The Catholic Church defined that you could uh, have an abortion up to viability, which is what, 24 weeks? Quickening. Quickening. Is the term. Correct. Quickening. Which is usually around four months. Really? Right. The Catholic Church permitted As that? I understand it, but then it got the infallibility. The Pope, the Catholic Church became, I think, much more authoritarian after the end of the 19th century with the absolute power of the Pope and, and male hierarchy, which has always been there anyway. There's no women that have ever gotten through that glass ceiling ever, right? Right. So, um, so that's the legal basis of Roe, and that's what she argued in the court. And the court said, essentially, she's right. That, that is correct. Ever since then, though, there's been uh, a backlash. So this was accomplished in the early days of the feminist movement. Of course, it was the second wave, too. What was the first wave of a women's movement? Suffrage. Suffrage, which we're celebrating this year. Robin knows all about that, right? Why don't you say a little bit mm -hmm. about that? Well, uh, simply that uh, the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom is um, honoring the fact that this is the 100th anniversary of women getting the right to vote. And uh, Vermont was very sluggardly in- Slugger? Yeah, in supporting that initially, the, uh, the governor was against uh, even allowing the vote to happen here. So we, we did not initially, as a state, support it. But it's only required, I think, two-thirds majority to, uh, and it can become law back in the day, and that finally happened. But anyway, uh, we are holding some events uh, in October of this year. A woman who's a wonderful speaker on this subject will be here in Burlington and at various schools, right. high schools. Right, right, right. Yeah. okay. Yeah. So that was the first wave, and it occurred the first wave of a women's suffrage movement was right after the Civil War until 1920. And the reason that women really wanted to vote at the time of the Civil War is so many women had worked for the abolitionist movement. And they really felt that, you know, if black people, if black men can vote, so should, so should black women, so should all women be allowed to vote, and that didn't happen. And so after that was turned down, because you'll notice in the 15th Amendment, black men got the right to vote only, not black women, not white women. Did property ownership play into that at all? At that time, no. 
At that time, the property qualifications for voting had been mainly eliminated, mm -hmm. and there was a reason for that. You know, what, what, when were those in effect? At the it was a, in effect in the early days of the republic. Yeah. Right, but you know, there's so much property here, and you could gain property fairly easy by robbing it from some Native Americans. And so the property qualifications didn't make that much sense after a while. But the oppression of women continued, and, the, and black people, of course. So black men got the right to vote before women did. But we all knew that, right? And so the women, that was the first movement of women against, for their own rights as a women's movement. All the men were in it because, of course, it recognized, the suffrage movement recognizes that women are people, women are equal to men, and women should have the right to vote because they have equal brains of men. And, it put and some do and some don't. Right? It, it put a schism between women and black people, black men, because they were mad. Yeah, women were why mad. Should these, why should these guys, these, in fact, uh, one of the leaders of the women's movement said, why should these Sambos be able mm -hmm. to enter the door before us? That was her. Yeah, was one one woman. Woman. I mean, people have been have been pushing for that for a long time. I mean, um, John Adams, who the Senate yes. president, um, um, Abigail Adams, you know, famously wrote to him, "Remember the ladies." Mm -hmm. But he didn't, did he? No. no. <laughs> Women didn't get he the vote. Laughed. He kind of he kind of grew up. Oh, what was that? So cute, you know. And you guys rule us at home, in the bedroom, in the kitchen. You know, you know you're in charge, you're in charge, ladies. But he wasn't the worst guy in the world, John Adams. He really was rather an abolitionist as well. In terms of, of that issue, yeah. yeah but the right. Going straight, right. right, but there were a lot. In other words, I'm trying to say there were a lot worse than, than the Adams. I have always kind of liked the Adams because they were so against slavery. Yeah, no, yeah, I like that. Yeah. yeah, but anyway, so that's kind of the historical interpretation of Roe v. Wade. Since that time, by the way, there's been a huge battle. So that, the first women's movement suffrage. The second wave, which I was involved in, many of the women here were involved in, was the wave around. Basically, the core demand was uh, rights to control your body, rights to have birth control, and a right to uh, terminate pregnancies. Now, why is that so important is the question. And I have to, you have to, I mean, what freedom does a woman have if they don't have those rights? What kind of liberty does a woman have if she's always capable of getting pregnant until how old? From the time that maybe 13 until the time they're 45 or 50? And that's really what happens in societies where women don't have the right to choose. When I first moved here, or I was working what? Or access to contraception. Right. But when I first moved here in the, the 19, late 1960s, I was working at Legal Aid, uh, and uh, I was becoming a lawyer actually. And I was um, I was a volunteer at Legal Aid, and that's where I studied the law. And there were many other women, and they were part of the staff of Legal Aid. There weren't very many women attorneys at that time. In fact, I was one of the first hundred women in the state of Vermont who became an attorney. And the staff at Legal Aid were uh, women from the local communities, and they all happened to live in Winooski, mostly. And they were part of the French Catholic Quebec tradition. And all of them, and that was 68, had 10 or 14 kids, yeah, brothers and sisters. And I came from a family of five, which I thought was large, because I came from a Quebec family also. My mother was Quebecois. And uh, big, big families. So I've always thought, like, what's going on here? Well, there were Catholic families. Um, and it was all that was a sin for which you could get excommunicated, even if you used birth control. Um, and you that's what happens. You excommunicated for using birth control? Yes, it's an abortion particularly, yes. Well, yeah, but... but you're not supposed to. Contraceptives? Yes, they were. In fact, I grew up in the state of Massachusetts. Anybody else grew up there? Where contraception was illegal. And in Connecticut. And, no, in Connecticut, right. That was the first legal case, was Connecticut. Illegal until 1968, contraception. Oh, really? Yeah. Yes, you don't remember all that? Why not? Why am I the only I mean, Margaret Sanger had done her, had become famous and so what? done her work two, three decades earlier, right? I, in New York, right? 
Yeah. I was saying her in New York. Yeah, but I'm not certain she changed the law. <laughs> and the, you, you know, you can change the law in one state, but you can't change it nationwide unless you go to the court, which happened, Roe v. Wade was 73. Right. So it wasn't, I mean, I, I moved to Wisconsin in, in uh, when the heck was that, 65, and I went to Wisconsin, and birth control was illegal. I couldn't believe it. You could get condoms in Wisconsin, couldn't in Massachusetts. We had a friend who had, you know, what happened to a woman who, a teenager, who would get pregnant in Massachusetts in the 50s and 60s? What did you have to do? You don't remember, nobody's from Massachusetts, I guess, lucky you. Um, although I love Massachusetts now, but you would have had to, especially as a Catholic girl, you'd have had to go to a home for unwed mothers and deliver the baby and give it up for adoption. It was pretty, that's the way it was. Can you remind us, and we went to the story of Roe v. Wade, who was a you know, teenager in Texas, I think, and it was her second or third pregnancy? I don't know her story. Norma, Norma um, Covington. That was, what you're talking about is the one here in Vermont, I think her name was Norma. No, that was Jack. Jack Lenar. Norma something. I used to know her name. Like, I, I thought it was Covington, name. but I'm not certain. Well, what happened anyway? Sorry. Oh no, that's she was. Like, could remind me. Of, could, she you, she was the row. Yeah. Yeah. And and she had had. I think it was a, it was a second or third pregnancy, and I can't remember if she had the other ones or not. And she actually maybe I think had given birth to the child before the case was even heard. So what was I, it like? I'm trying to remember the story. I mean, yeah. You know, no, no, she, I, I don't. Know. I don't think. I'm not certain she ever did have an abortion because. It had to go through the courts. Right. Yeah, it had to go through all the courts. But um, so women in other countries which don't have the right to choose, they still have 13, 14 kids yeah. in a family. And the problem that that's a problem for the whole society at that point. Because women with that many kids can't really, as far as I can tell, unless it's enormous effort, they can't really participate in society if they if you have that many kids, right? Right, you can't exactly. really. You're home taking care well, of. All you can't be a first-class citizen if you do not, if you're not able to control your reproductive mm -hmm. life. Mm -hmm. It's just that's what always really struck me is that without that right, women's lives are truncated. Yeah. You know, but at the end, and in those societies, if women have that right, though, think also, think about the population problem. Would you have a population problem if women chose how many kids mm -hmm. to have? Mm -hmm. You wouldn't have one. Mm -hmm. Would you? How many women would choose to have a kid every two years? We're, we're way past the point of not having a population problem, don't you think? What's that? Kind of, the population problems here to stay, I think. I don't think so. Okay. Not if you empower women, I don't think so. I don't think I you would have a population the, the, problem. The, the, the carrying capacity of the planet went over in about 1835. That, that's a big argument, I think, which is great that you're bringing it up, because that is the argument that's often used in the environmental crisis, that there are too many people. And I think that that's true in the environmental discussion. I think people, though, should be discussing that, maybe, but as well be discussing what would happen. How would you solve the population problem? I, I, mean, I just think it's, it could be politically a little bit dicey to talk about birth controls or right. control population. Because I know it. People, pe people look, I don't know, because I don't even want to talk about it you know, in a way because you know, it's looked at who, then who, who is going to be using that? You know, and who, who do you think would be using it? Well, I don't know, I just, I, I, I'm sorry to talk so much. No, no don't go ahead, go ahead, it's an important argument. You, using what? Well, you know, I think that there's some people who might talk about, well, we want these kinds of people, you know, uh, in lower economic, uh, situations probably to really use you know let's give them a lot of birth control and, and then on the another side of the coin I often hear people who I feel like they're not going to have any children because it's just wrong to have children and I'm like you know what I think that should, if you had kids that they'd be good citizens I would love for you to have at least one child you know but um, whose decision is it in the end the guys? Um, no, just kidding. <laughs> Who? What were we gonna say? I said the guys. I was kidding. It was a joke. But, but, the, but what? <laughs> what is the Hyde Amendment? Doesn't the Hyde Amendment? Yes, the Hyde Amendment. Go ahead. Payment uh, for poor women to be able to get abortion for free. The other way around. The Hyde it Amendment prevents. prohibited 
well, prohibited federal funds. Federal funds to go for abortion. Well, that's what I'm saying. That's right the opposite of what you were thinking. Instead of the men in charge saying, let's limit these poor people from having more kids, they're mandating that they have to have more kids by refusing to let them have birth control. But, yeah, but they don't couch the argument in that way. What, the, what they say is that you shouldn't have sex. <laughs> that's well, true. that's true. I just heard it the other day. Well, because and I'm really? this yeah. issue is, is about controlling women's bodies. Right. You know, in the English common law, right, women and children were chattel. Right. They were, they were owned by, by men. Controlled yeah. by men. Or maybe not owned, but controlled. No, not really. Not but marriage does. Right. Ma no, marriage does say. Marriage, marriage, does, marriage does, yeah. does say that. All marriage says that. It's to, it's presumed. Marriage gives the ma the husband the right to claim those kids as his. If you're single, by the way, and I used to always say to women, a uh, mother has many more rights as an unmarried woman to her children than if she's married. Because mm. in the marriage law, uh, a, fa a husband is automatically the father, automatically, whether it's true or not. The husband is the presumed father of, a, of his wife's children, which gives him rights to the kids that he doesn't have as a single parent. What's the reason for that? Because who knows who the father is if you're single? Right. Right? So all of this is based on biology, basically. So men who are married and are having sex, presumably, with his, their wives, it is a presumption that they are the fathers. It gives those children. Well, what's the name of a, of a child, used to be, who's born out of wedlock? What? Bastard. Bastard, right? So a child that is born to a woman alone without a husband was always delegitimatized in the society, right? And they were not either, they weren't heirs of the father. Being a husband gives a man rights to the child and it gives the man a person or a kid that he can leave his property to with some degree of certainty. Or does it, doesn't it? That's the reason to me for marriage. And also, marriage supposedly was instituted to protect women, too. Although being a domestic lawyer, I've seen too many cases where marriage doesn't do that. Far too many, right? But anyway, so what do we all think of this? Why is this such a t tricky issue, too? So the reason that it came up, comes up more and more in my mind is the present presidential election. But it's come up in my mind many, many other times. When, when did this, when did abortion rights actually even become an issue? Because it seems to me that it's fairly recent. I mean, up until, I don't know when, who cared? I mean, who, who you cared? Know, suddenly it's Why were there laws against it always? There were always laws against it. I don't think so. There were laws against it even in Vermont until 72. There were laws all you over the country. Way before that, yeah. Like, where did they originate? Yeah, because they originate because there's many reasons, but the but the originate in. Be when when did the law start caring about? Oh well, at, at the time I believe that medical schools were established. Frankly, prior to that, reproduction and birth had been assisted by whom? Women, right. midwives. Yeah. So at that time, I doubt if it was illegal, because who knew about it? Nobody, right. Right. Although there's a lot of movies yeah. which exactly. indicate that it, you could get in trouble about well, it. Well, I think that it goes, maybe it goes back, maybe, I don't know, but what you said about uh, it's a way of controlling behavior, when people wanted to change the way that people were acting, you know, the free love and everything, right? You know, they'd be like, you know, so if you have to pay the consequences for this behavior, because you can't get an abortion, maybe that will curb this, uh, you know, free love thing was happening in the 60s. I think it's always been against the law for doctors to do it in particular. Okay. Number one. Uh, and which you might, was Vermont's law. Which was Vermont's law. Illegal for doctors. Yeah. Right. But there's really, in tradition, for, first of all, why would it be illegal or a taboo? Even a taboo subject. Why? What is it based on the fact that women are not cannot be in charge of their own bodies? What's yeah, it all based yeah, on? Exactly. Well, you tell me. Guess. Tell. Take a guess. Well, why? Why does why the does president care? care? 
about Well, the church says, the Catholic Church in particular, says that it's homicide. Yeah, okay, that's their opinion, I'm, but... But they hold sway over much of the world. And, you know, you might say that's not a great thing. They hold, it shouldn't hold sway over. Because you're law. speaking like an American. You're speaking like an American. There should be separation of church and state, which it says in the First Amendment to the Constitution. The rest of the world doesn't think the rest. No country, many, few countries, don't mm -hmm. buy that. For one thing, so religion holds a lot of power still in most countries of the world, including countries that you wouldn't expect, like Iran and like the Muslim world. Um, even in England, it's a theocracy. The Queen of England is has to be Episcopalian, and that church really those are called theocracies, where religion and God still rule. All those things, women's women's are controlled, right? And now I don't know. You can I, get an abortion in England. And no, of course I, I didn't say England. I said England was a theocracy. I don't know what their laws are on that subject, but other countries are Australia. also theocracies and do have laws against women's right to choose. But it's not only religion. What else? Why does it come? I saw The Godfather last night. Really interesting. Do you know when the woman finally leaves the awful Godfather? Remember that, Godfather 2? I don't remember it. Because she has an abortion. Where were we? Yeah. What? I don't think I saw the whole thing. This is part two. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure I saw it. He kicks her out at that point because she, she gets an abortion of his child. I think that that is the ultimate control that in a male dominated society, that is the, that is the real. Uh, control over women's bodies, isn't it? Well, I mean, there, what is? The control over birth control. Uh -huh. It's the men who decide, in other words, how women are going to behave. Well, in ancient history, before uh, people living in clans and so on knew that uh, contraception would lead to uh, the birth of a, of a baby, um, it was more of a matriarchy. Right. I mean, it, it, so the determining who the father was, then the father had an investment in right. this creature right. and was concerned about inheritance. Right. And so all the inheritance laws were, were made to sort of support men and the kind of patriarchy that was created and their, proge them. And their progeny, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, I mean, they're, they're, I mean, they're, women were beheaded for not producing male mm. for it. For and that was in England, exactly. Sally. Like, yeah, I know. Right. <laughs> no, that's true. Sturdy example. But, um, but so when, does anybody know when, at what point medical science figured out that it's the, the, the male who determines the sex of the, the child? Does anyone? I don't know. Because that, that was like not that long ago, really. No, well, but also the key thing in this country was the development of DNA. Right, and that, to the, establish paternity. Right, to establish is, paternity. Yeah, because because other, before that, you, if you were not married, you, you didn't, nobody knew who the exactly. father was with certainty. Exactly. You know, but once you were married, it was presumed that the husband was the father, and then DNA really nailed men. Right. No, it really nailed them because once the DNA test was done and a father would be identified as father, guess what he has to do? Right. Play child support. Right. So, I mean, all of this is deeply in family law, which is never discussed anywhere, and it's one of the most unpopular parts of the law, right? Tracy has worked with me in the legal clinic and it's really pretty emotional, isn't it? Mm -hmm. And tedious. You have to put up with a lot to be a continual family law person. But anyway, so, but I find that this is an issue in the upcoming election and I'm curious. Um, somebody said, I watched a debate the other night which said that white women will choose Trump over Bernie. And I wanted to, is that true? President Trump has said he would like to, at one point he said he wanted to punish women 
who had abortions. That's one thing he said, that, they, that the woman herself should be criminalized. And most pro-life, whatever they call themselves now, if they don't even say that. They say that the doctor should be criminalized, but they don't say that about a woman. But Trump went on to say, well, if it's such a serious matter, and if, if it's the death of a human being, then the woman herself should go to jail. Which is true in much of Latin America, right? Like El Salvador, right? Mm -hmm. In other parts of Latin America. Go ahead. I think there's another kind of analysis that probably other people in the room could do better than me that runs parallel to this, which is that at a certain point women started to become better educated, become more successful in business, mm -hmm. getting closer to that glass ceiling. And you know, perhaps there was some conscious or unconscious thought that if women were to stay in their place and have children, it wouldn't be challenging because then men wouldn't have to share or give up any of that power. Yeah, that's true. But that's really in the States. I mean, there's so many women in the world who are never going to read and write. That is the States, yeah. Yeah. So I, I think what, what I also try to do when I think about women is I really do try to think of the international position of women. And it's still, I mean, in this country, you could argue that women have equal rights, and we might even get a constitutional amendment about it. It's really not true, except in a lot of other countries, it's just not true. Well, you were bringing up Trump, though, and I was just yeah. trying to think about what, where he's coming from and why women would. I know it. What is the point? They did last time. Women, white women, voted for Trump over Hillary Clinton. Why? Why would? And then economic this reasons. argument. I find that really hard. Well, economic reasons mm -hmm. they voted for Hillary. Clinton. I don't think so. I mean, they may have voted for him. Have you seen any? These are white suburban women, women that would call themselves, they, they call them, and maybe it's a pejorative, but they, but they called them soccer moms. They weren't, they're not poor. Do you think they're overly influenced by their husbands? No. Who they vote for? No. Is it geographically influenced? I can't figure it out except I'll tell you what I think, but it's, so, yeah. I don't think that women stick together very much. Mm. I don't think they like Hillary. I don't know why. I can't imagine. I, I wonder if there's any data on that. They I say there's data there. on it, Sally. They show it. Who does? In fact, the, the, the pollsters, the, the people who keep statistics, they all say that. They said maybe it's not true, but I've heard nothing to the contrary. I'm going to look into it because I find that. But what hard. the reason was is not really explained. Really, that they didn't like Hillary? I don't know why. I don't, I'm asking you guys, what is your opinion? If that is, because it's going to, they say. I don't believe that's true. <laughs> okay, you find that out until the next time, okay? I believe it's true. I believe that's I true. Mean, I think he, there were a lot of white women and white people in general who voted for Trump. That's I do too. Who, that's who did vote for him. But I don't think it's like more white women than They'd voted They find for it him. out, please, because that's what they're saying. But beyond that, they're all, the pundits, the people who keep statistics, they were arguing that the same thing is going to happen don't choose yeah. Trump over Bernie? Yeah. What? And the reason that I, I find it so curious is that Bernie doesn't talk about this issue much. But Bernie Sanders, Senator Sanders, is a huge proponent of choice. Yeah. Huge. Yeah. And has been. And, maybe years. Should, and he should probably talk about it more because. That's I what I'm that wondering. Is, That's why I think. That is, that is an important issue. And, and he, uh, I mean, Pro Choice Vermont gave him an award one year know. for his. Uh, enduring support for women's right to choose. Does anybody have any think, thinking about that? Why? Is it true that they will, that women will do that again if they did it in the first time, which I think they did? Well, I mean, it's not as a block. It, what? It's yeah. not as a block of women. But, well, they're saying it was, the suburban women, white women. That's what, they, that's what the statisticians and the people who looked at all that said. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm, I'm, that warrants some research because that's really hard to believe. And you yeah. haven't ever heard that? No. Well, I heard it all the time. I, I heard it again I yesterday. I think the women were when people voted for Trump, I think the women voted along with their husbands. And really? many of them were living in rural areas outside of cities, but they were nonetheless the people who kind of found their lives more difficult that year or those years than they than previously. They were the women who were whose husbands and, and who themselves were losing their jobs because 
before the plans were closed. No, I, I they were, I mean, shall we say, the way Hillary said, they were the deplorables. I know. And, 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 that's and true. so that's how they voted. So part of the explanation for the vote is exactly the socioeconomic. It was a protest vote, really, and I, I agree with you. Mm -hmm. It was, it was a, a vote against but, but the you're saying it was, vote. I think you're saying it was a class-based thing, that, and I understand that. That, that poorer people voted for Trump because their lives were miserable. I understand that. But this is not what the, what, they, what people who have studied it say. I mean, they say it about middle class women, white women. But also a, a gigantic meme, I believe it's called. What's, it, what's was a meme? A meme, a sort of a, a, a stereotype about Hillary Clinton that, uh, you know, about her emails, about that she was corrupt. You know, and these stories of that she should go to jail, and this was just hammered down on people during the election, as if it was true. And uh, uh, I, you know, I don't, I don't know to what degree. I mean, the Wiki, WikiLeaks reveals that there were shenanigans, certainly in uh, in the Democratic. Uh, uh, planning of, of trying to control Bernie from having power, but I think those those ideas that she should go to jail. I mean, come on, and the, and the emails that the Jill, this Jill, Jill far less Hi, Jill. Then welcome. Excuse me. Yeah. Hi. We have a seat for you. Um, Jill, why don't we have a seat? Now I'll introduce you to the camera. Okay. okay. This is. Yep, Jill yes, yeah. This is Jill Krowinski, who's coming in from the legislature. Um, and Jill was a big supporter and sponsor of the legislation that codified Roe v. Wade into the Vermont law, right? Jill? Right. And this representative, Jill Krowinski, she's also, you're also the leader of the Democratic Party, aren't you? I am the House Majority Leader. Okay, he's what, yeah, okay, the House Majority <laughs> Leader, and she whips all the Democrats into place, I hope. Do you? Can you tell us Thank what you. happened at the State House today? I can. Mm -hmm. Okay, so Jill's going to give us, no, I want <laughs> you to start with that. We've been talking about Roe v. Wade and the codification of it into Vermont law and the history of it. Um, and what we're going to do about the next election for women. But also, Jill is here. She's just fresh out of the legislature where they've made some really important decisions today. And so why don't you give us an update? Wow. Well, yeah, I think that we have incredible work to do this legislative session to advance issues that help support women and families. So I can, I can talk yeah. about after this at um, H57 and Prop 5, which are our reproductive rights uh, package of legislation. Uh, today, we had a vote on a bill to create a paid family and medical leave program in Vermont, which would give, uh, through a small payroll tax, uh, new parents uh, 12 weeks for bonding at 90% wage replacement and eight weeks to take care of a sick family member. Um, which paid. Would, hmm? Paid. Paid. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. And uh, get, has a voluntary opt in if you want um, TDI, temporary disability insurance, for yourself. Uh, we had a, the governor, uh, this has gone through many committees and many floor votes, and uh, the governor recently vetoed the bill. And so today the House had an override vote, and unfortunately we fell one vote short. One? One, oh, one vote. Goodness. So this is, shows the importance of every single vote for every single elected official that you care about because this is how it trickles up um, when you have people who don't necessarily vote the same way their community wants but, or but isn't this the same sort of bill that trump just gave permission to federal workers that they would have uh, leave uh, yes yeah, so it's leave? interesting because um Governor Scott did a similar thing in that while he was negotiating with the State Employees Association on their contract, he gave them, um, a, there's a provision in the contract that creates a paid family and medical leave program just for state employees. Um, and it creates an opt-in for the general public, but because it's all voluntary for members of the public, it's a much more expensive plan to run. So, uh, it is interesting that here we are, um, 
federal employees get it through Trump, state employees get it through Scott, and yet the rest of us are now still waiting um, to get access to a program that we can afford. And so this is one that we'll be taking to the voters because this is a critical issue for women. And in so many ways, economic security, health outcomes, um, equal pay, I mean, it's, it touches so many um, buckets of issues that we, uh, I assume, all care about and advocate mm -hmm. for. So uh, I'm fired up. <laughs> so did you just come from that boat today? Yes. And, and That's why I was the And it failed? <laughs> Yes. Who yeah. voted for the Democrats, Democrats, right? Yeah, yes. where was the whip? You're the no, no, she's she's majority whip. leader. But weren't you trying to whip everyone into line? <laughs> that is easier said than done. <laughs> um, unlike the Republican Party, um, where there's just line loyalty, we have robust conversations with people um, with their, the challenges that they are having with some of the provisions in the bill. And the group, um, so we, let me just pause for a second. In the House, there are 150 seats. If we need to override a vote, you need 100 votes. It's two thirds of the members present in the room. House uh, Democrats have 95 votes. So if we need to get to 100, we have to find a coalition of people to join us. With the Republicans. So the Republicans all voted against it. We got one independent on board, and we were able to get the Progressive Party Caucus on board, and there were four uh, Democrats who we could not get on board or they changed their mind at the last minute. Who were they? Uh, the members, uh, Randall Zott, Chris Bates, Cynthia Browning, and Linda Joy Sullivan. They're, and they're Democrats? Yeah, well, <laughs> I think some of them uh, identify more as independents, but I guess they caucus with us. Mm -hmm. So once there's a vote taken like that, an override, can they, can it still, if, if one of, someone, if someone voted against it, they, can they still ask for reconsideration? Yes, so there is a procedural motion that could be made only the day after the vote. Like tomorrow. And it, so it could only happen tomorrow, mm -hmm. and it could only happen at the very beginning of the session, of, you know, while we're in session, or the mm -hmm. end of orders of that day, mm -hmm. and uh, during announcements. And it has to be made from someone who voted against, against it, right. to say I make a motion to reconsider. Is anyone working on that tonight? I remember doing that, making yes. a lot of phone calls. So you're here, I bet you're going to go home and work on it. Uh, there are some other people that are working on it right now. Mm -hmm. um, I think wow. it is, uh, I, to be frank with you, I think it's a heavy lift. The issues that um, these members have are all over the political spectrum. Mm -hmm. uh, some people say it's too much, and some people say it's not enough. The progressives are arguing that, right? Yes, in but they did, did they did join you. They though. did join mm -hmm. us, and so um, I think we have a huge legislative agenda ahead of us that includes minimum wage. <coughs> we have several climate change um, bills like that are coming through. We have a tax and regulate the marijuana bill coming. We have a gun safety bill that's going to be coming to the floor. So um, we will try to see if we can change um, and get and get a possible vote on reconsideration. But I feel like it's pretty unlikely, mm -hmm. and that we need to forge ahead on the rest of our agenda um, because we are like four weeks away from crossover, which is when all the bills have to switch bodies um, to be considered and get closer to the path of becoming law. So it's a oh, interesting yeah, session. So, so Scott vetoed it? Yes. That's interesting. That should probably be known. He said it's too expensive. What? He said it's too expensive. So, so women, so so women carry, carry uh, the ball for like covering for work that doesn't get paid for. Mm -hmm. I mean, as, as has ever been true. Yeah. Yeah, really. It's really interesting because in his budget address, he talked about spending a lot of money and not raising any taxes. And so we were like, how are you going to do that? We want to see the details on what's going to get cut, right? And one of his proposals was to um, increase access to um, 
uh, nurses visiting new parents, and I just wanted to say, they're not gonna be home because they have to be at work, right. because they don't have access to a paid leave program. And so, um, <laughs> uh, you know, <laughs> I think this is a really important reminder to all of us, is like, legislative races are important, but right. this year the governor's race is critical if we're ever gonna be able to make progress on issues that help women. And, and the fam and families. And women and families, right. and um, you know, we shouldn't be governing by overrides, which is what is starting to happen. It's like these really critical policies that can help families are, get, are you know, coming up against whether or not we can form a coalition to get to 100, and that doesn't feel right. And um, I'm, so I'm, I'm deeply, deeply disappointed and frustrated, and I'm even like more geared up now to help out on the gubernatorial race, whoever mm -hmm. wins the primary. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's going to be a primary, right? Yeah, that's right. Mm -hmm. David Zuckerman is running for governor, right? Yep, David Zuckerman and Rebecca Holcomb. But but uh, he would be a um, independent, so no. there would be two people running no. against. He's not an independent. He's running in the Democratic that's primary. Right? And he right? said he will not yeah, run control. separately. Yeah. Correct. He has? Oh, okay. He's yeah. running as a Democrat. I guess a PD or what? Yeah. He's, well, the important thing is he's in the Democratic primary. <laughs> and so therefore he's going to come out of the primary if he wins as a Democrat. I think, right? Unless I he, don't know with what he's going to do after. I know that he's running in the Democratic primary. Right. And he's running like Bernie basically is doing in the Democratic primary. And he's getting a lot of crap from, from the Democrats, right? Really, a lot. I'm like just very laser focused. So yeah. I know. <laughs> well, we we're all laser, laser focused. It's good that you're here because I've been laser focused on Iowa. Yes. Right. Yes. So it's good that you're here to remind us that something is going on in Montpelier also. Yeah. So you might talk a little bit because we have been talking about Roe v. Wade and reproductive sure. rights. Jill was very critical in passing in the legislature last year, right? Yeah. A codification of Roe v. Wade into Vermont law. So why don't you talk a little, what does it, that even mean? Sure, yeah. well, so I'll say this, at, during the campaign in, what was it, 17, 18, going into, I'm like, 18 for 19. So this last election cycle, while we were on the campaign trail, we, um, we weren't anticipating having to take action on abortion rights in the state because Forever. Because <laughs> we were part of it, Sally and me and Beth. Yeah. Yes. So we, you know, we don't have anything in law, but there was a court case um, that said that Medicaid could cover, no. It, the law was, before that was the Jacqueline R case. That's right. Right. So there was a court case, um, ironically, that Senator Leahy, right? <laughs> yeah, but he was, he, he, was was a state, he was the prosecutor, right. Um, right that said that a doctor shouldn't be criminalized for providing abortion care. Right. And that was the basis for saying in Vermont that abortion was legal. Um, so while we're on the campaign trail, the Supreme Court vacancy happens and Kavanaugh gets sworn in. And a lot of us who have been working on reproductive rights for a long time, my background is from Planned Parenthood, all Reeked out, <laughs> for lack of a better term. Mm -hmm. we, we need to come together to see if, if we are fully protected in Vermont because what the direction that's happening in Washington and frankly across the, the country, we need to make sure that reproductive rights in Vermont are 110% protected. And, uh, and after having several conversations, it became clear that we had an opportunity and we needed to take time this legislative session to make sure that we were completely safe and guarded. And what that turned into was a short-term strategy and a long-term strategy. So the short-term strategy was to get um, a bill passed that would put into our state statute to say that every individual has a right to, um, uh, to, to not choose to be sterilized. Um, legislative language, right? So you could choose whether or not um, to be sterilized. You could choose um, to carry a pregnancy or you could choose to have an abortion. And that is the essence of codifying Roe in our, it, we kept it very, very simple and straightforward. Um, 
so the bill, H-57, started in the House. Uh, when it came to the floor, there were a slew of amendments that were targeted to weaken it, everything from waiting periods, um, transvaginal ultrasounds, you name it. Um, and uh, we were able to beat back every single amendment. Um, like I told Sandy, I would not let a bill come to the floor that I thought would get watered down and that it was critical that we had the strongest language possible. So we beat back every amendment and it advanced to the Senate. They supported it and it, we, it went to the governor. Um, so that was the short term plan. And he signed it. He signed it. Yeah. I will say that he had told Planned Parenthood that he was um, supportive of reproductive rights and was a little I would say vague on certain um, right. questionnaires. And so he was in a place where he could not, <laughs> this is the essence of supporting reproductive rights. Uh, so he did, um, he did sign that bill. The other um, legislative strategy for the long-term plan is making sure that um, abortion rights are codified in our state constitution. So amending our state constitution is like a legislative marathon that spans four years and ends with a ballot initiative. And so this started, um, all ballot initiatives to change the constitution have to start in the Senate, every other biennium. So we were in the window where we could do that. Um, they, uh, the Senate passed it and then we took it up and passed it. This does not need a, a gubernatorial signature. Um, so that's like lap one around the racetrack is getting a constitutional amendment through the House and the Senate and one biennium. So now we'll have an election and that means we need to be asking people yeah. who are running right. for right. office, mm -hmm. where do you stand on Prop 5? Mm -hmm. After the election, we'll come back and we have to go through the same process again but it can't be amended. So it goes to the Senate, goes to the House. After it clears that next biennium, it goes on the ballot. So in 2022, we will have um, Prop 5 on our ballot in November. So the Constitution of Vermont then will be amended? If it passes, if it, passes, it yeah. will be amended. And is it, does it pass by a simple majority of voters? Uh, yes. And it can't be, the bill itself can't be amended now, from now on? From now on. Because it's been through one cycle of yep. both, all of those That's houses. right. So does that create a potential conflict between federal and state My, law if Roe v. Wade is overturned? Well, but if Roe v. Wade is overturned, which I don't think it will be, but I think it will be restricted so much that it's going to make women's lives miserable. But I don't think they would dare to overturn it. But if they overturn it, then the law reverts to the state. So Vermont will be then in charge of their own law because Roe v. Wade will be gone, and so then that issue will be controlled by the state government. So it's more likely they're going to restrict it to say no abortions after the first trimester. Uh, well, we're not going to because of no, 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 the, the, the federal government. The federal no, the federal the, law the, might the, say it's restricted. That's what I think. For instance, there was a bill um, in one of the Dakotas, I think, that was going to make ectopic pregnancies. Well, yeah, I know, and they said that, that because doctors had to like remove the piece, and that's yeah. totally scientifically impossible. So I mean, I know, it, but they wanted to make that subject. That's how much they know about pregnancies. It shows it is scientifically <laughs> really right. ridiculous. So, anybody have any questions for Jill? Well, what do you see happening if this did become law in the future? And um, Roe, the holding was restricted and it conflicted with the Vermont law. What could happen? So it, the, sh the short answer is it can't conflict mm -hmm. because the way that a lot, all of these, legis these legislative initiatives and these court cases basically say um, it goes back to the states. Right. So right. it yeah. wouldn't be, it would be a state decision on how you want to re uh, regulate abortion oh, okay. care. Okay. Right. So it'd be, and it'd so be in Vermont. I'll give you a perfect yes. example of what Scott wanted to do at one point when he was running for office. He wanted to say that it was okay 
to pass a law mandating that a young girl, a pregnant girl, would have to get the consent of her parents. It was called parental consent. Yeah. So, Wait a minute. So okay, what, 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 that's the kind of restriction that Phil Scott wanted. So, when I, many, so in those years, there were groups of us who opposed him on that. Why would that be? Why would that, Howard Dean had the best argument about that of anybody. Did you really? know that? Yeah. No. He's very pro-choice, but I, well, I know, I know. I mean, he's a doctor. Yeah. Do you yeah. know what he said? This was really interesting. He said, "It's I've seen too many times where the father of the mother is the father of the fetus." Figure that out. Uh, it's Vermont. I'm not too much. What? Right. Yeah. So he opposed all that. He opposed all restrictions on abortion. And Vermont has the least restrictions on it of anybody, of any other state, isn't it? Um, I think there are other states that uh, have taken action recently to protect access uh -huh. that are cl very close right. to us. Yeah. But it's the work of people like Jill and, and grassroots movements who have made Vermont really different than other states. You know, we have a consciousness that doesn't seem to be the same as in many other states on a lot of questions, like on the death penalty too. Right. Would you see a situation where um, women from other states would start to come to Maybe, you? maybe. And how would that be, how would that go over? I it's fine. Know. There's no. There's nothing wrong about that or illegal okay, about it. Well, for, for us. No, 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 there's I'm nothing. Saying, I'm just saying. From all women in New York, New York so socially, yeah. if there, if there would be I imagine so people who don't like abortion will not like that. They don't have to know. They don't know. They won't know about it. It's a private matter. The women can yeah. come here and go to a doctor. Or a dentist. Or a dentist. Or a veterinarian. Anybody. Anybody. Yeah, these are confidential, you know, Proceedings. medical visits. So um, I don't, I don't. I don't yeah, see it. That didn't come, that really didn't come up in conversation mm -hmm. at the state house. And I, I'll also say this that, you know, we are a rural state and sometimes finding, and we have borders that our communities are, you know, um, Vermont, in Vermont and New Hampshire or Vermont and New York. And it's a, they're like blended communities where you regularly go across, you know, the street to a different state to get your groceries and then come back. Cigarettes, whatever. There's a, a that's the same in healthcare, and so right, and think, including with Quebec. Yeah. Yeah. So I would just say that we already are in a space where people are either coming in or going out to see their medical providers. Mm -hmm. um, even in, in mass, we just we just see that based on what communities are. So if that's not something that's um, different, I will say that there's a concern about a sh uh, an oncoming um, shortage of abortion providers. Um, there's a generation of providers that are starting to retire, and there's a gap. Um, with and more and more um, people are being trained, providers are being trained to do that. Uh, but it's a conversation that's been happening a lot. And so you might just see people going out, out of Vermont or coming into Vermont based on the number of providers and, and um, health centers that are, that are open. Another thing that could impact that is the uh, federal government has eliminated Title X funding for health centers um, that impact mainly Planned Parenthood and other reproductive health clinics across the country. And so there are health centers that had just, they just closed. Right. Also, there's, there's always threats of violence against clinics mm -hmm. and doctors. Yeah. So anything else for Jill, or should we let her go home and make phone calls? <laughs> yeah, probably. Yeah. All right. Um, yes, I would like to bring up another issue, and it's uh, okay. HR 7, I believe. Which is that? Uh, concerning the, that's for oh, her. Yep. Oh, okay. I heard it. Uh, about the F-35. Mm -hmm. This is a statement from the Quaker meeting in Burlington. We passed it and I uh, updated it just um, today. Uh, and let me, because we have a different approach. I mean, we bring up issues that I think are not usually brought up in this argument about the impact of the F-35s on our community. As Quakers, we aspire to be good stewards of the world's resources. The proposed rollout of 2,663 of these gigantic military machines is a flagrant waste of resources. 
As Quakers, we are historically opposed to war. As Quakers, we value frugality. I'm just cutting across it. Um, we mourn the human skills and the brilliant minds of engineers, mechanics, and software designers wasted on building this weapon of destruction. And finally, as Quakers, we sit in silence in our meetings for worship. Our Burlington meeting is near the flight path for airplanes landing and taking off at Burlington International Airport. We dread the possible future roar of the F-35s into our worship and community space, not to speak of the debilitating noise impact on the children, citizens, and animals of Winooski, Williston, and South Burlington. We join with many Vermonters to protest the militarization of our community. So I'm wondering where that uh, resolution, or is it a, a law? At, currently, it passed in the Senate last time around, and um, it's in front of the Military and General Affairs Committee with Mr. Um, Stevens. Tom Stevens. Stevens, yes, Tom Stevens. He's okay. from Chicken. He's from uh, Waterbury. Waterbury, no. yeah. So, uh, but you have a powerful role to play uh, in also pushing it forward. Right. So the F thirty five, the the it's not a bill; it's a resolution. Mm -hmm. Right. Just so everyone knows, and it's currently in our House General and Military Affairs Committee. I have been meeting with members from the coalition who oppose the F-35s over the course of the last year. And I think where I am coming from with this, and I'm still willing to have conversations and to talk about it, is there's nothing that we can do in the legislature to change that. We don't have the power to say, oh, our Green Mountain, you know, our National Guard can't accept F-35s. We don't have that power. The power lies within the federal government. So I can't pass anything that will change that decision. But what I can do is to see what can we do locally to protect our, our vulnerable Vermonters against the sound. So I've been looking into ways that we may be able to monitor the sound better and, and be transparent about the sound. Um, looking for ways to make sure that homes for the people who want them to stay in their home and have it be insulated so they're safe, have access to those funds to have that happen. So I, I can't tell you how many issues come before us that it's something the federal government is doing that is having an impact on Vermonters that we can't change. It's not in our power to change and it's incredibly frustrating. But that's so. what a resolution is. It's um, saying we don't like it. it. It's not, as you say, it's not a law. You're saying we protest what the federal mm -hmm. government is doing. Why can't that resolution be I could be send a letter. I, I, we could have a vote. It will go to Washington and yeah. they'll put it in the shutter. That would be, that, I would love that. I have talked to, ahead. I, I've talked to people in the military that make some of these decisions at conferences that I've been to with legislative leaders. And I'll say this, like I come from a military family and I understand like the respect and the, the guardedness that they have and the protectiveness for, for what they do. Um, but the attitude that I got back was pretty shocking um, and disappointing. And not the- What a, was that attitude? That you, like, it's not your decision. Yeah, right, Don't right. bother me. Mm -hmm. What do you think you're doing? And so I was just like, okay, <laughs> if I can't make inroads and just even have a conversation with you about it, and this is the attitude that we're gonna get, I need to find other paths that, that actually will be productive and help people in our communities. Because we could send them something every day and it won't make any difference. It is clear that they don't care about our feedback from what we do. I think that another thing that we, that I want to look at and see if we can do, and I, I'm part of an organization called Will Wand, and it's a group of legislators across the country that oppose the amount of military spending. And so we advocate at conferences, meeting with our federal delegations to say, we want that money. We, we want it every year, it's a different ask, but it's like, we want a 20% cut out of the, the military budget and we want that to go into public education. 
We want to, that to go into higher education. And we, we do that lobbying, and I think that's one other path that we can take to address, because you mentioned in here the military funding, and I agree with you. I think it's outrageous. And, and the other thing is, look, we need a new president. <laughs> yeah. We just do. Like, mm -hmm. he's putting more and more and more money into, you know, this isn't even a conversation about cutting or moving. He's proactively cutting right. critical programs and putting that money into the military. Into, yeah. It's outrageous. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, I've just... <laughs> but I mean, the fact that the voters have 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 voted in Burlington 55% saying we don't so we don't want it here and then in Williston and South Burlington the city councils have also voted so so that yeah. would be a backbone for you to I, I just don't think they care. care. Yeah. I mean, well, I know, but you, we care and you care. Yeah, no, I mean, okay. I could even send a letter, but I'm just telling you, like, it's just really depressing and frustrating that the, the, some of these tools that we have aren't making difference. I'm not seeing any change or any response to what we did in Burlington or South Burlington. It was Winooski, by the way, not Wilson. Winooski, thank you. Yeah. Um, City Council of Minuski, yes, they supported yeah. it. They did not support the F-35. Yeah, yeah right. no, but you said Williston, and they did not. Mm. Williston, I don't think, took it up. I don't know that for mm. sure, but I do know that well, Minuski did. I think they did, but... I hope so. It'd be great. And you might be right. Mm. Okay. Mm. Well, thank, um, thank you for taking the time to do Yeah, this thank you. I think we're... Committee. But what not to say, but if I could just, I mean, and this elephant in the room, but... And, and I know, you know, so for schools, for example, I mean, this is a really, and you, I'm probably already just saying something that you already know, mm -hmm. but the, um, I, I lived um, down in the Springfield, Massachusetts area mm -hmm. for a while. That's where I'm from. There, there were some large cargo military planes that were, uh, that I guess did come in with the FedEx um, expansion of the airport there. Mm -hmm. um, and there, we had some studies that showed that the very loud um, airplanes, which of course sometimes also dropped parts, but the, that every time you go over a school or a hospital, it's disruptive to what's supposed to be going on there. So these are actually hurting the education of children, especially yeah. right over there in Winooski at that school. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, I think that there is a really big impact there. If you look at the maps, if they managed to make it the line like just a, a fraction of an inch away from where the, the school is. So I think there's a big impact there. And, and for me, so um, I'm a fairly new resident in Burlington. I was in Montpelier for oh, a long time and in some other places. Well, like eight years. Yeah. I, um, I, I'm very disheartened and disappointed by Senator Sanders' disinterest in, in being willing to talk about this yeah. and to even consider really the qual how it affects the quality of life mm -hmm. for people in Burlington. I just don't see that he's been willing to well, engage not, in that right. conversation. Yeah. He's not alone in it either, unfortunately. They, right. Oh, is there any... None, none of them will talk about it. No, none of them will talk about it. Robin, have you had meetings with their office? No, nobody has. No. Oh, no. yes, he won't meet on it. None of them will. It's not no. just him. No, no. It's Lady 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 Lady. <laughs> Peter Welsh won't, although he, Peter Welsh has said that um, he's, he's when, when there was a discussion about who was going to pay for noise mitigation costs, um, and it was the uh, part of it, the money would come from the federal government, and the communities were going to have to fork over the, yeah, yeah, the probably, balance. Probably Peter Wells said he was on our side on that. Okay, okay but we really should. Really should we were running, running out of time. Way outside anymore. Yeah. Mm -hmm. right. Yeah, and I think just one last yeah. thing about that, that as, the, uh, as spring comes along and the windows are open mm -hmm. and people hear the sound and there are a full 20 of these uh, uh, um, Planes. Uh, okay. a, a bombers uh, going overhead, because Leahy did say to, Leahy's office has said to us that if we can get all three of the of, of the congressman together, him, Welch, and Sanders together in one meeting, he will meet. Right. So that is what he said. That. So I think once things really become dire in in our communities in the spring, we need to in, insist on having that meeting. I will. Yeah. yeah. That's great. Okay. Well, I do want to just make you. a plug for for Prop Five. What's that all about? <laughs> Please. <laughs> 
ask your ask your candidate, you know, at, when we're done with session, everyone's going to be running for office, and I would just ask that you hold us accountable and ask us the question about Prop 5, because it's really, really important, especially given more, more threats that are coming from Washington. Yeah. And what's Thank the you, longer name for Prop 5? It's Proposition 5. I know, but what is it about? The, just um, so, our, oh, our viewers so it's know. abortion right. the okay. It's the constitutional oh. amendment. Yeah, okay. it's the constitutional All right. Um, well, thanks, Jill. Thank you very much for that update. And yes, good absolutely. work. Thank I, you. We all, I think we all think it was good work, what she did with the report. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, right. yeah. So thank you very much. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, thank thanks you for, for having me. And I guess that concludes our session tonight. So we'll see you in a couple weeks.